live on a 20-acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border. And 15 minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sound I've ever heard, if it was an animal. It happened almost right outside the property, which is only about 50 feet away from where I am now. It was a very loud whistle. I heard it four times, spaced out by like 15 to 30 seconds, and each whistle was different. No repeating tunes or notes. It was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four independent whistled tunes, it was followed by a sound that almost sounded like a frustrated sigh. Then nothing. Then the whole thing would start all over again. I sat there listening to this, like somebody was just facing the property outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, huffing in frustration, and then doing it again. What's even stranger is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time. The owls over the lake, which is also frequent. But while this was happening, I didn't hear any of that. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from is an open field. It's so dark I can't see my hand in front of my face when I go out there. The weirdest thing is, we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away in the other direction. This sound came from the road side of the property. The closest neighbors in that direction are over a mile away. We also have two donkeys on the property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning the herd, which would mean that maybe it was a human I was hearing. But like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so they would have had to hop the fence. And whistling is a really weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Update. It's now 30 minutes after the initial thing happened. I hear the horses running fast away from where the sound originated. Then, about a minute later, I hear their hooves heading back to where the sound originated. This happened several times. I am really confused. My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. It was almost normal. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming at me when he hadn't actually called me at all because I got home later and I asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering this is what inspired me to tell this story. A few years ago, I was about a mile out into the woods in Pennsylvania when I kind of zoned out for a minute. I zoned back in and I heard a stick snap. I looked over to see a white tailed doe staring at me from about 10 feet away. It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just kind of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. If you're familiar with deer at all, you know this is very strange behavior. Usually, the deer are the ones that run. At the very least, they freeze, 
but they certainly don't try to sneak up on you. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now, but looking back on all the times that I just sort of brushed off as normal, I'm starting to think maybe there was nothing normal about it. There's Something in the Woods, by Reddit user Saint Circa, posted to r slash paranormal in a comment. In the days just after high school, many would have labeled me a vagrant. I had no fixed home, but wasn't entirely homeless. Growing up in a struggling factory town guaranteed few prospects. Most of us young folks understood one thing, to escape the dead-end future of our hometown we needed to leave, seek work elsewhere, and avoid returning, lest we be ensnared into its cycle of despair. I was no exception to this rule. This drive to escape impending poverty led me to the pipeline industry, where I took on grueling labor roles that thankfully paid reasonably well. It was an acceptable start for someone like me. After three months on the job, my foreman, who I'll refer to as Jay, learned that I was living out of a motel. He generously offered me a room in his home until I could secure an apartment, and I was deeply appreciative. Jay's family were genuine rural folks, residing in an unpretentious part of the Chillicothe countryside. Their property consisted of a house, a barn, and vast fields hemmed in by the wooded hills. It was the kind of isolated setting I was familiar with. No neighbors, and a single road connecting it to the world. I felt fortunate for this unexpected twist of fate. My first night there, after a hearty dinner with Jay's family, I stepped outside for a cigarette, choosing the tree line behind the barn as my secluded spot. The moon was full and high by then, bathing the valley in a soft glow and casting the nearby hills as mere silhouettes. Most would describe the scene as serene, but as I treaded on the grass, a deep-rooted, instinctual unease began to stir within me. Undeterred, I ventured closer to the tree line, trying to quell the growing sense of tread. Upon reaching the tree's shadowed threshold, I lit a match for my cigarette. And that's when I saw it. A mere few feet into the woods stood a massive silhouette, easily over seven feet, even while crouching. It had large pointed ears and an elongated snout. Its eyes reflected an eerie infrared hue, typical of nocturnal animals caught in a light. My mind raced. A wolf? But that's impossible. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Wolves don't stand on two legs. This creature was unmistakably bipedal its imposing form leaning against a nearby tree. Frozen in terror, I could do nothing as our gazes locked. This standoff, though brief, felt eternal. At last, seemingly satisfied with its intimidation, the creature straightened up and retreated noiselessly into the woods' deeper shadows. Regaining control of my limbs, I bolted back to Jay's house, bursting in to alert them of the lurking menace. Jay, glancing calmly at his wife, advised, If you're going to stay here, know that there are things in those woods best left alone. Hear an odd noise? Ignore it. See an unusual shadow? No, you didn't. Feel something strange? Come inside and forget it. We respect them because it's their land. We're just temporary residents. Fifteen years have passed since my eerie encounter. Even though I remained with Jay and his family for another three weeks, an unshakable unease haunted me throughout. The woods at night are no place for the wary or the wise. Once you glimpse what lies hidden, the world never looks the same. While some might dismiss my tale as fiction, it's not and it's a story that I felt compelled to share. I 
I feel creeped out even typing this story. I'm staying at my friend's house in Tennessee over winter break, and tonight I helped her feed the neighbor's dogs because they were out of town. Her house is in a somewhat rural area. There are clusters of homes kind of spread across fields, forests, and lake areas, all very beautiful and full of lots of wildlife. It's about 9 p.m. and it's way past sunset. It's quite dark and we're walking the short distance from the neighbor's house back to hers. We are on a road, but directly next to us is a small wooded area sloping down to the lake. I'm a little nervous about it, so I make a joke like, that forest is kind of creeping me out. Imagine if there's a skinwalker out there. She laughed and gobbled like a turkey loudly into the forest. Jokingly, I said, don't do that, it'll attract one. Not five seconds later, we hear an identical gobble back to us from the forest. It was definitely not an echo. There was no light out there, no paths, and it was very cold, like 30 degrees. I can't imagine anybody would just be hanging out in the woods on the off chance they could mock somebody. What's weirder is that it sounded like her. It sounded as though somebody had recorded her voice and played it back. I just remember saying, oh my God, and then sprinting as fast as I could back to the house. I don't think I've ever run so fast or with so much intention in all my life. I didn't turn back and I was so out of breath it hurt. My friend thought the whole thing was funny, but I didn't. It was so freaky. Did we see or encounter a skinwalker or was it something else? I live in the mountains and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There's a little spot you can walk into in the woods, which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. My friend and I have gone to picnic there. And this day that we went there, we started hearing this flute. It was really loud and it was coming from a direction where there were no houses. It sounded like a woodwind of sort something that sounded very spiritual. All of my neighbors were pretty old, and I can guarantee that none of them spend their time walking in the woods playing a flute. We heard this for hours. We left at about eight o'clock that night, and when we walked back, you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for about two years after that, but one night I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. My bed was right next to the window and I had cracked it to let in some fresh air while I slept. I woke up to the sound of the flute coming right outside my window. I was too worried to look out and see what it was. It went on for about an hour before it finally stopped playing. And to this day, I have never heard it again. I was born and raised on a farm in northern Michigan, a stretch of land that had been in my family for generations. Growing up, my father often told tales of curious and eerie happenings in the surrounding woods, strange noises, inexplicable tracks, and more. While he never spoke directly of the dogman, the local legends always seemed to lurk in the background of his stories. I shrugged them off as rural myths interesting tales to spook the younger kids. However, the events of last winter made me reconsider everything. We've always had a lot of animals on the farm, cows, chickens, and a few horses. Keeping them safe and well-fed was a part of the daily routine, one that had become second nature to me. 
That's why I was so alarmed when our livestock started acting uneasy. Cows refused to go out to pasture. Chickens stopped laying eggs. And the horses seemed perpetually spooked. Then, one frosty morning, I discovered that one of our cows was missing. A search of the farm yielded nothing. Just a set of unusual tracks leading away from the barn and into the forest. A mix of paw and hoof prints, large and unsettling. I followed them as far as I dared, but saw no sign of the missing cow or what might have taken her. My mind raced to the tales my father used to tell and the grim realization that perhaps they were rooted in something real. A week later, the howling began. Long, eerie howls that echoed across the fields, chilling me to my core. I had heard wolves and coyotes before, but this was different. It sounded both animalistic and oddly human, a disquieting combination that left an unsettling feeling in my gut. Armed with a shotgun, I decided to keep watch one night, determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. Hours passed in tense anticipation, every rustle in the trees and shift in the wind raising my alertness. And then, just past midnight, it appeared. At the edge of the field, silhouetted against the moonlight, stood a figure unlike any animal I had ever seen. It was tall and covered in dark fur, standing on two legs with the posture of a man. Yet its head was that of a dog or wolf, complete with glowing yellow eyes that locked into mine with a chilling intensity. The dog man. It had to be. Fear and disbelief gripped me, but before I could even think of raising my shotgun, the creature let out an ear-piercing howl and bolted into the woods, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. I stood there, heart pounding, shotgun trembling in my hands, questioning the very fabric of reality. The livestock remained uneasy in the days that followed, but there were no more missing animals, no more chilling howls in the night. Still, I couldn't shake the eerie encounter from my mind, and eventually I took to setting up extra fences and installing security cameras around the farm. I haven't seen the dog man since that night, but the experience has forever changed my perception of the woods that surround our farm. They say that legends are born from grains of truth, and I can't help but wonder how many other local tales are waiting to step out from the shadows of folklore into the harsh light of reality. Now I listen a bit more closely when the old timers talk, their stories laced with warnings and veiled truths. The fields and forests of Michigan are beautiful, yes, but they're also ancient and full of mysteries, some better left undiscovered. Life in my Michigan cabin had always been a tranquil experience, a deliberate withdrawal from the chaos of modern existence. Nestled deep in the woods, it was a place where time seemed to pause, where the relentless chatter of society was replaced by the hum of the wind and the chattering of woodland creatures. But that serenity would eventually give way to a series of disturbing events, events that would chip away at my skepticism and introduce me to a very real local legend, the Dogman. It all began on a crisp autumn evening. The leaves had turned a myriad of oranges and reds, and the air carried a fresh, earthy scent. I was chopping wood near my shed when I heard it. A low growl, different from the usual sounds that the forest animals made. It was guttural and strangely menacing. I paused, axe in hand, scanning the tree line for the source. But there was nothing, just the fading light casting long, haunting shadows. Over the next few weeks, odd occurrences started to disrupt the quietude of my life. I would wake up to find things outside my cabin moved or knocked over, my firewood scattered, my trash cans toppled, and most unsettlingly, claw marks on the trees surrounding my property. These were no ordinary marks. They were far too large and deliberate. 
not like anything that a deer or even a bear would make. The tension escalated one night when the growling returned. It was louder this time, closer, accompanied by heavy footsteps that circled my cabin. I sat in the darkness, clutching a hunting rifle, peering nervously through my curtains at the ominous void beyond the glass. Then I saw the eyes, two yellow orbs glowing in the dark staring directly at me. My heart pounded in my chest as a figure emerged from the shadows, tall and bipedal, covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was a nightmarish blend of man and wolf, and in that chilling moment, I knew I was face to face with the dog man. Our eyes locked and the creature let out a haunting howl that echoed through the forest, filling the air with a palpable sense of dread. I raised my rifle, my hands shaking, but the creature seemed to sense my intention and vanished into the woods, its growl fading into the distance, but its presence lingering like an unspoken threat. Days turned into weeks and the incidents around my cabin continued, yet I couldn't bring myself to leave. This was my home and I would not be driven out by fear. But I took precautions, installing heavy duty locks and reinforcing my windows always keeping my rifle within arm's reach. Then came the night that would forever alter my understanding of the world. A powerful storm was rolling in, the wind howling like a chorus of anguished souls, the trees swaying violently in the tempest. It was the perfect backdrop for the dog man's return, and return it did. The creature appeared at my window, its eyes glowing even brighter against the stormy darkness its snarl sending a chill down my spine. But this time I was ready. I grabbed my rifle, aimed at those menacing eyes, and fired. The bullet shattered the window and hit its mark, but the creature let out a howl, not of pain, but of anger, of indignation. It backed away, its eyes locked onto mine for one last moment before disappearing into the tempest leaving me with a shattered window and a shattered worldview. I spent the rest of that stormy night in a state of heightened alert, rifle in hand, grappling with the surreal reality of my situation. I had faced the Dogman, a creature of local legend and frightening reality, and had come away with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurk in the Michigan woods. The experiences around my cabin have since quieted down but the sense of unease remains. I've shared my story with a few close friends who have met it with a mixture of skepticism and intrigued concern. And while I don't know if the dog man will ever return, I continue to live here in my secluded Michigan cabin, forever aware that some legends are grounded in truths too unsettling to dismiss, lurking in the shadows of both our world and our imagination. In the heart of Michigan, where the dense woods serve as a living canvas of ever-changing foliage and elusive wildlife, locals often whisper tales of a creature known only as the Dog Man. Half man, half wolf, it is a legend that strikes both curiosity and dread into the hearts of those who venture into the wilderness. As for me, a woman with a passion for the great outdoors and a healthy skepticism of local myths, I would soon find myself entangled in the fabric of this tale. Equipped with a trusty tent, camping gear, and my loyal German Shepherd Max, I set off for a weekend retreat in the Manistee National Forest. The drive was peaceful, the hum of the engine accompanied by the melodic serenade of birdsong filtering through the open windows. By late afternoon, I found the perfect spot a clearing by a serene lake, hidden from the world by a curtain of trees and towering pines. After pitching my tent and building a campfire, I sat by the lake, losing myself in the reflections of the twilight sky on the water. Max, ever vigilant, 
stood by my side, his eyes scanning the surroundings, as if he sensed something that I couldn't. I laughed off his behavior, tossing a stick for him to fetch, and snapping some pictures with my camera. The first inkling that something was amiss came as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of indigo and obsidian. An eerie howl echoed through the trees, a sound that seemed neither fully animal nor human. Max growled low in his throat, his body tense, eyes fixed on the darkening woods. Unsettled but not yet afraid, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent. With Max beside me, I zipped it, tucking myself into my sleeping bag while leaving my flashlight and pocket knife within arm's reach, just in case. In the dead of night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, and heavy. Max's low growl filled the tent as he bared his teeth, staring at the fabric walls as if he could see through it. My heart pounding, I grabbed my flashlight and pocket knife and unzipped the tent cautiously, my hands shaking with a mixture of cold and fear. What I saw in that moment will haunt me forever. Bathed in the pale light of my flashlight was a creature standing on two legs, its body covered in dark fur, its eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. It was the Dog Man, the living, breathing embodiment of Michigan's most unsettling legend. Our eyes met and a chill ran down my spine. It wasn't just the appearance of the creature that frightened me, it was the intelligence I saw in its eyes, a malevolent cunning that hinted at something far more terrifying than any wild animal. Before I could react, Max lunged at the creature, snapping and growling with a ferocity I'd never seen in him. The dog man let out a snarl of frustration, or perhaps surprise, and for a moment, just a moment, it seemed to reconsider. It was that momentary distraction that gave me the chance to act. I shouted loudly, my voice tinged with desperation, and hurled my pocket knife at the creature. Miraculously, it hit its mark, and the dog man let out a low howl of pain, or perhaps anger retreating into the dark depths of the forest. I quickly grabbed Max, zipped up my tent, and sat there, trembling in the silence that followed, a silence that felt like the world holding its breath. When dawn finally broke, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, leaving behind the tranquility of the lake for the harsh reality of the known world. I never reported my encounter, but I also never returned to those woods. The experience forever changed me, shattering my skepticism and leaving me with an unshakable respect for the stories and legends that shape our understanding of the wilderness. The Michigan woods are a place of beauty, but they are also a realm where myths walk on four legs, or sometimes two, and where the line between the natural and the supernatural is eternally blurred. Eastbrook, a quaint town tucked away in Maine, has always intrigued me with its rich lore and the tales of the enigmatic Eastbrook Harpy. According to local folklore, this cryptid is a blend of woman and bird, with the ability to emit a wail that freezes even the bravest hearts. I decided to venture into the Maine woods, armed with a camera, a voice recorder, and a compass determined to unravel the truth behind the harpy myth. The woods exuded a mystical atmosphere. Old growth trees loomed high above their branches, woven into intricate patterns that seemed to obscure the sky. The forest floor was a quiet orchestra of rustling leaves and hidden life. Despite the picturesque setting, a sense of foreboding seeped through, as though the forest itself was warning me of what lay ahead. It wasn't long before I reached a clearing, believed by locals to be a hot spot for harpy sightings. 
With bated breath and beating heart, I set up my makeshift base, placing the voice recorder in the middle of the clearing and setting the camera to capture any movement. Is anyone here? I asked into the void, my voice somehow managing to pierce the heavy silence. Nothing. Just the whispering wind and the distant hoot of an owl. If you're the Eastbrook Carpy, can you give me a sign? And then it happened. A scream unlike any I had ever heard ripped through the forest air. A melding of human agony and avian screech. My camera trembled in my hands as I aimed it toward the source of the sound. For a brief moment, I saw it. A figure, half woman, half bird, perched atop a tree. Its eyes glowed a fierce yellow, and a spread of feathers framed its form. The entity took flight, disappearing into the canopy of trees, but not before it left me with a sense of existential dread, a reminder of my fragility in a world filled with unknowns. I collected my equipment, my hands shaking, and made my way out of the woods, each step weighed down by the energy of what I had just experienced. As I reviewed the footage days later, I found that the camera had malfunctioned at the critical moment, turning my tangible evidence into nothing more than a personal anecdote tinged with the supernatural. I've never returned to those woods, but the experience lingers like a haunting melody, a brush with an entity or a legend that refused to be captured but left its mark nonetheless. Whether the Eastbrook Carpy is real or just a figment of collective imagination, I can't say. What I do know is that some mysteries are woven so deeply into the fabric of a place that they become inseparable from it, part of the pulse that makes each leaf quiver and every shadow dance. And sometimes those mysteries find a way to reveal themselves if only for a fleeting moment, in ways that leave us questioning the boundaries of what we consider to be real. Hiking the Appalachian Trail had been my dream for as long as I could remember. The stretch that passes through Maine was said to be both the most beautiful and the most challenging, so I saved it for last. With my trusty backpack and hiking boots, I set off, my heart filled with excitement and a little bit of dread. I made good progress the first day, covering a significant distance as the dense Maine woods wrapped around me like an emerald embrace. It was during the second day that I stumbled upon the strange artifact, an odd-shaped rock with mysterious carvings, half buried in the ground. I didn't recognize the symbols, but they fascinated me enough to keep it as a keepsake. By nightfall of the third day, I began hearing them, the footsteps, soft but deliberate, keeping pace with me but always remaining unseen. I told myself it was just an animal, but I knew better. The footprints I found the next morning confirmed it. They were human, but much larger, almost unnaturally so. That's when I remembered an old Maine legend about the specter moose, an albino moose that was not just an animal, but a spirit of the forest. It was said to appear in times of great change a harbinger of things to come. On the fourth night, I saw it. Under the moonlight, the specter moose revealed itself. It was an incredible sight, larger than any moose I had ever seen, its white fur almost glowing in the dark. But what struck me the most were its eyes. They looked almost human, filled with a wisdom that seemed to transcend time. It gestured with its head, as if inviting me to follow. I hesitated, but then thought of the artifact in my pocket. Could it be related? Compelled to find out, I followed the specter moose deeper into the woods. 
it led me to a clearing where the moonlight revealed another set of carvings, similar to the ones on the artifact. It was a story depicting coexistence between humans and the forest, and a warning against disrupting the natural balance. As I touched the carvings, the artifact in my pocket seemed to resonate, vibrating gently as if to acknowledge its twin. The specter moose looked at me one last time, its gaze almost approving, before vanishing into the forest. I resumed my hike the next day, but something had changed. The trail was the same, the challenge as demanding as ever, but I was different. I had walked into the woods as a lone hiker, chasing a dream. I walked out with the weight of revelation that were all part of a larger, connected system, forever bound by the stories that shape us. I left the artifact back where I found it, deciding that some things are better left untouched, their mysteries free to captivate the next wanderer brave enough to venture into the deep main woods. In the vast wilderness of Maine, home to ancient forests and sprawling lakes, there exists a legend that has fascinated adventurers and locals alike for generations the legend of Pomola. Said to be a creature with the body of a man, the head of a moose, and the wings and talons of an eagle, Pomola is believed to reside near Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in the state. Tales of encounters with this mythic being have been whispered around campfires, leaving an impression on the collective psyche of the region. Driven by a mix of skepticism and insatiable curiosity, I decided to embark on a journey to investigate this elusive figure. Equipped with a backpack containing essential gear, thermal camera, voice recorder, and basic survival tools, I set forth toward Mount Katahdin, a formidable entity rising against the backdrop of Maine's wilderness. As I trekked through the dense forest, my boots sinking slightly into the mossy ground, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the landscape around me. The trees seemed like ancient guardians, and the wind whispered secrets only they were privy to. It was as if the entire forest was holding its breath, anticipating something profound. I finally reached a vantage point near the base of Mount Katahdin, as the sun dipped below the horizon. The fading light cast long shadows that danced in the chill of the approaching night. I set up my thermal camera and initiated the voice recorder. If you're out there, Pomola, I mean no harm. I simply wish to understand. I spoke softly into the recorder, the words almost freezing in the icy air. For what felt like an eternity, there was silence, save for the distant rustle of leaves and the occasional howl of a far-off wolf. Then, out of nowhere, a cacophonous roar shattered the tranquility. My thermal camera picked up a rapid fluctuation in temperature, registering a form that was neither wholly animal nor completely human. For a brief second, my eyes met what I can only describe as a visage melding moose and man, framed by expansive feathered wings. Just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into the looming darkness of the mountain, leaving behind an unnerving silence and a sense of awe that gripped my very core. I collected my equipment and retreated, my footsteps quickening with each yard, a newfound respect for the legend filling my thoughts. In the days that followed, I examined the data and recordings which offered no conclusive evidence no photographs, no ground-breaking EVPs. Yet the experience itself became a different form of evidence, a haunting reminder that legends often contain kernels of truth, folded into the fabric of the places they inhabit. I have yet to return to Mount Katahdin, but the legend of Pomola remains etched in my memory, 
a spectral presence that defies explanation yet demands reverence. Whether it's a guardian spirit of the mountain, a cryptid, or a mere figment of collective folklore, I cannot say. But what is clear is that in the shadowed corners of Maine's wilderness, mystery and wonder are alive, compelling us to question the boundaries of our understanding and to respect the ancient stories that ripple through the land. I decided to go on a solo camping trip in the woods of Eastbrook, Maine. I have been going through some stuff recently and figured that nature would be the perfect escape. I did my research, chose a site, and packed my gear. I was aware of some local legends about the Eastbrook Harpy, but I figured it was all folklore, something to spook the kids. I set up camp in a secluded spot, pretty far from the nearest road. The first day was wonderful. I hiked, cooked some food over a fire, and watched the stars come out. As night fell, I crawled into my tent and settled in for a peaceful sleep. Then I heard it. Around midnight, the forest erupted into this blood-curdling scream. It wasn't an animal. I know what bears and coyotes sound like. This was something else. Something human, but twisted. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent a bit to take a look. What I saw next will haunt me forever. About 50 feet away, illuminated by the moonlight, was this figure. It looked like a woman, but her eyes were glowing a faint yellow. Her arms were elongated, with fingers that were way too long. And then she opened her wings. Yes, wings. Feathered, massive, and horrifying. She let out another scream, and then soared upward disappearing into the tree canopy. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. As soon as the sun came up, I packed my things and hightailed it out of there. The thing is, when I got back to my car, there were scratch marks all over it, like something had tried to get in. I've done some digging since I got home, and I found old newspaper articles about sightings of the Eastbrook Harpy. The descriptions match what I saw. This thing has been spotted by locals for decades. I don't know what's out there, and I can't explain what I saw, but I know I won't be going back into those woods alone. I'm even considering selling my camping gear. Be careful out there. You never know what's lurking in the woods. I've been camping my entire life. Deserts, mountains, forests. I thought I'd seen it all. But Maine offered a different kind of solitude. An untouched landscape dotted with old Native American rock paintings that promised more than just a weekend away. It offered an opportunity to truly test myself. The challenge was simple survive a week in the deep woods with minimal supplies. Day one passed without a hitch. I set up a basic camp, caught some fish, and started a fire. As the evening wore on, I admired the rock paintings near my campsite. Figures of men and animals, but also of winged creatures that looked almost divine. That night, something changed. I woke up to find my camp disturbed. My food supply was nearly gone. Had it been an animal? Or perhaps another camper? But no, I was miles away from the nearest trail. A feeling of unease settled over me. On the second night, it happened again, but this time, I heard flapping wings and thunderous cries that shook the ground. Frightened, I clutched my knife and peered into the darkness. Nothing. 
By the third day, exhaustion was setting in, yet a curious feeling of anticipation overwhelmed me. I found more rock paintings. These depicted what looked like a giant bird locked in combat with human warriors. Thunderbird, the legend said, a powerful spirit creature of Native American folklore. On the final night, I heard the flapping wings again. This time, they were louder, closer. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of my tent and looked up. What I saw was magnificent and terrifying. A colossal bird, its feathers shimmering with an ethereal glow, its eyes like burning coals. It circled above me, and then, with a powerful cry that echoed through the woods, disappeared into the night sky. Morning light revealed no evidence of my nocturnal visitor, but the feeling of awe remained. I had completed the challenge, but I realized the true test was not of my survival skills, but of my ability to face the unknown, to coexist with something greater than myself. As I packed up, I felt a newfound sense of respect, not just for nature, but for the ancient myths and legends that had lived long before me. I walked away from that week not just as a camper, but as someone who had been touched by something far older and far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. And so I left the forest, a place that had frightened yet enlightened me, knowing that the legend of the Thunderbird was real, at least for those willing to look beyond the veil of the ordinary world. Strange Structures by Tammy the Wanderer, 97. I live near the Smoky Mountains. I won't give the exact location for reasons you'll soon understand. I'm an avid hiker, and I've explored most of the marked trails around here. However, last week I decided to venture off the beaten path. I had a good map, supplies, a compass, the whole shebang. It was supposed to be a full day hike into some of the less visited areas. About five hours into my hike, I came across a clearing that wasn't on my map. In the center of this clearing were these structures. The best way I can describe them is a mix between sculptures and monoliths, made out of what looked like a combination of wood, stone, and some sort of shiny metallic material that I couldn't identify. They stood in a perfect circle, about seven feet tall each, with intricate symbols carved into them. Now, here's the thing. They weren't just random piles of stones or haphazardly placed wooden beams. No, these structures looked designed. Every symbol, every curve, every placement seemed intentional. They gave off an aura of both age and modernity, if that makes any sense. It was like looking at ancient relics, but with futuristic tools used to make them. The air around them felt charged, almost electric. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was intruding on something sacred or significant. As I approached one of the structures, my compass started going haywire, spinning in all directions. I took out my phone to snap a picture, but it immediately died even though it had been at 80% just moments before. I'll admit, I was more than a little freaked out. I decided to mark the spot on my physical map and hightail it out of there. The whole way back, I had this eerie sensation of being watched. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a twig put me on edge. Back in civilization, I started doing some research. I checked local histories, indigenous stories, even conspiracy forums. I mean, I was desperate, okay? But nothing. No mention of these structures or anything like them. A week later, I tried to go back with a friend, but we couldn't find the clearing or the structures. It was like they had vanished. Anyone have any ideas? Art project? Alien stuff? Some cult ritual? Please tell me I'm not going crazy.
One Year Apart by Reddit user Calligrapher Pitiful 3 posted to r slash backwoods creepy in a comment. This is a true story that has consumed my thoughts, trying to make sense of what transpired. I'll attempt to keep this concise without omitting critical details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, far from the conveniences of city life. The wilderness has always been my solace and sanctuary. Yet, these woods felt malevolent, making me regret my decision to come to Washington State. My wife's uncle, Jay, along with a family friend, Kay, purchased some land north of Spokane, Washington. They acquired it at a reduced rate because of contamination from a nearby aluminum smelter, rendering the groundwater unusable. The two divided the land into two plots, each setting up a camper as their residence. Over time, Jay became increasingly paranoid, convinced that he was being watched from the trees. Three months in, he was assaulted by a man wandering the woods, resulting in Jay's broken jaw. When arrested, this stranger confessed to an overwhelming impulse to see if a single punch could be lethal. Nearly two months later, Jay was brutally killed while asleep on his camper's couch. Kay, upon discovering the body, fled in panic before contacting the police. Authorities swiftly apprehended the 19-year-old perpetrator, who said that he killed him merely to steal his bike. The weapon of choice was a power tool left nearby, which he used to inflict fatal injuries. Traumatized, Kay moved in with another family member. However, after eight months, circumstances forced him back to the land. Overwhelmed by fear, he persuaded my pregnant wife and me to join him. The moment we entered the property, I was gripped by an inexplicable dread. Hundreds of crows blanketed the dirt road leading to the property. My first night was sleepless, filled with a heightened sense of anxiety. I attributed this unease to the knowledge of Jay's murder, but every moment felt as if we were being observed. The atmosphere was constantly eerie, the sensation of being watched never ceasing, especially after sundown. Life began to find some semblance of normality until Kay suddenly started experiencing bouts of nausea and dizziness. When taken to the hospital, they dismissed it as a probable flu. Coincidentally, it was around the anniversary of Jay's death when Kay, in a frantic state, crashed his car into a tree, dying moments later. Within a year of moving there, both Jay and Kay were gone. Now it was just my wife and me on this ominous land, constantly apprehensive and trying to make sense of the tragedies. If you are squeamish about animals, this next part you might want to skip and fast forward through. One day, I was horrified to discover remnants of mutilated chipmunks inside of our water drum, seemingly placed there intentionally. Night times became increasingly unbearable, filled with mysterious noises and shadows. The nocturnal ambiance was disrupted by snapping branches, rustling pine needles, and screeching owls. Every night, I found myself vigilant, anticipating the manifestation of some lurking evil. One particularly foggy evening, as my wife and I returned, my anxiety spiked. In this fog, I spotted an orange, long-haired, mangy cat with intensely fierce eyes, emanating malevolence. As if on cue, the forest came alive with sounds, punctuated by an eerie call for help. This voice, seemingly belonging to a girl, then a woman, sounded distorted and deceptive. My wife, driven by concern, wanted to search for the source of the voice, but I restrained her, sensing something was amiss. We opted to use our vehicle, hoping the spotlights would reveal something. As we ventured farther, the chilling voice screamed from right outside the car. We sped off immediately. Upon reaching the main road, we contacted the police, who found no evidence of anyone in the woods. A day later, my wife gave birth. 
we never returned to that land. The events challenge my disbelief in the paranormal. I'm still left wondering, what could have caused these inexplicable occurrences? A year ago, while living in New Jersey, I currently live in Michigan, I came across a strange news story about a young hiker discovered dead in a mountainous forest. It initially seemed a routine incident, but the circumstances soon proved to be strange. The report indicated that the mountain was undergoing a period of heavy rainfall during that time. The downpour was relentless, sometimes exceeding half an inch per hour and it continued for several days before and during the search for the man. An autopsy conducted by a medical examiner revealed intriguing findings. Aside from a few scratches on his knees, the man displayed no visible injuries or signs of infection. However, the condition of his lungs and airways was alarming. The autopsy report emphasized the remarkable presence of pus in his tracheal bronchial tree. The man was only 28 years old. What's even stranger is that the coroner suggested the rainfall might have contributed to his condition. By the time the hiker was found, he had been dead for three days, and there was no record of him issuing any distress calls. It also hinted that hypothermia was not the cause of death. After this report, there were no subsequent updates about the man's case. It was a startling silence for such an unusual incident. A man found lifeless on a mountain, his lungs and airways filled with an abnormal amount of fluid. Sometimes, I still wonder about what really happened to him. I used to live near some haunted woods by Reddit user secondfiddle00, posted to r slash paranormal. I used to live in a reasonably large city. About two miles from my home, there was an expansive wooded area with a river running through it. My cousin and I spent countless hours in those woods. The area was littered with various discarded items, a few cars, numerous buckets and sheets of metal. Using some of that metal and wood, we built a clubhouse. It was a robust structure, sufficiently insulated to shield us from rain and inclement weather. It stood about a quarter mile deep into the woods. One day, I recall visiting my cousin's house, which was nearby. After spending some time there, he suggested, hey, let's go to the clubhouse. I was engrossed in a video game, so I replied, yeah, sure. Just let me finish this game. He told me he would stop by the store and would meet me at the clubhouse. By the time I set out, he had a 15 minute lead on me. Upon reaching the woods, an unsettling silence enveloped the area. The chirping of birds and the distant hum of cars were conspicuously absent. As I approached our clubhouse, I saw that our makeshift mailbox, a bucket nailed to a two by four, had been knocked over. As I bent down to pick up the piece of wood, a faint scratching noise emanated from the metal walls of our clubhouse. The world around me went silent, the kind of profound quiet where the only thing you might hear is the ringing in your ears. Jokingly, I called out, Camilo, you're terrible at hiding. To my surprise, a distorted clown-like laughter echoed from within the clubhouse. Thinking my cousin was playing a prank, I headed toward a nearby discarded car, about 50 feet away, to retrieve a stone we often used to hammer nails. It was then that I spotted my cousin. He was casually walking back from the store, sipping a soda. He explained that he had bumped into a school friend which had delayed him. 
With urgency, I told him that someone was inside of our clubhouse. Despite the inherent risk, our youthful bravado took over. He armed himself with a stick and I clutched the rock. We flung the clubhouse door open, only to find it empty, save for a mattress and a few books and magazines. I was sure I hadn't taken my eyes off the entrance and I would have noticed or heard someone leaving. We never did figure out who or what was behind that eerie laughter. I regret never delving deeper into the history of those woods. Sadly, in the years that followed, those woods were cleared away. In 2003, fresh out of high school, I was living in a quaint town in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia. Despite its breathtaking altitude and scenic views, it was a place with a small populace, exuding a distinctly rural vibe. One night, my best friend and I found ourselves lounging in her Honda Civic. We had parked on a secluded dirt road, deep within the woods ensconced by trees with a clearing overhead. As we chatted away, reveling in the melodies of our favorite tracks and enjoying some devil's lettuce, the clock neared one o'clock in the morning. Out of the blue, a strange phenomenon occurred. Every inch of our surroundings, the sky above and even the interior of our car, were illuminated by an intense neon blue light. This glow, which lasted for about two to three seconds, was unique because it was completely omnipresent. It didn't cast a shadow. It didn't really have a source. It wasn't like a spotlight. It felt as if the light permeated everything and vanished as quickly as it appeared. Our initial reaction was shock. We first thought maybe it was the police, but a quick scan of our environment confirmed our isolation no soul in sight, and the town was enveloped in its usual nocturnal stillness. Without exchanging many words, driven by a sense of unease, we started the car and made our way home. To this day, we have no idea what that light could have been. This is an experience I had a few years ago, which made me a believer in the paranormal. I hope you find it as interesting and creepy as I did. I went out very early in the morning, about 5 a.m., to take photos in the forest. I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during early mornings, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere. Much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old growth trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers which looked really cool to be honest, so I was very ready to go take some awesome photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, and I started walking straight in. After maybe a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and I felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on the trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we do have woodpeckers around here. So I didn't think that the sound was too unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I couldn't find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo of the bird, but I decided to move on. 
I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on the trees closest to me. At this point, I still didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear this knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird about it, since I had started to notice how it followed me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud and very clear heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly approached until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my whole entire body. After what felt like several seconds, I flew up and spun around to what I thought was going to be some kind of a big animal but nothing was there. For context, besides a few trees, this area was not particularly dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass, like a clearing. I picked up all my things and started walking quickly back toward my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew that something was mocking me. Feeling a little silly, I said, I'm leaving, okay? I knew that whatever it was didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I, on the other hand, did not. I went straight back to my car and I went home. Before this, I was pretty skeptical about the paranormal but this really changed my views. Since then, I've only had one other experience that I consider paranormal, but this is the one that scared me the most. It first appeared 10 miles in, just beyond a bend in the trail where the pine trees grew thick enough to turn daylight into dusk. A small wooden totem figure, weathered but intricately carved, a fusion of animal shapes and human faces, staked into the ground like a miniature sentry. I figured it was a trail marker or a backpacker's forgotten memento, so I took a photo and moved on. Another five miles later, there it was again. Same totem, same details, same inscrutable expression on its carved face. I picked it up, half expecting it to be the same one I'd seen earlier, as if I'd somehow looped back on myself. But my GPS showed a straight trajectory, and I knew the trail well enough to rule out accidental backtracking. An odd coincidence, surely. I left it where I found it, suppressing the nagging feeling that the forest had grown quieter, as if holding its breath. The third time left no room for coincidences. 17 miles into the hike, after crossing a stream that wasn't even on the map, the totem reappeared. The forest canopy seemed darker than before, the air thick with a silence that drowned even the rustling leaves. I looked over my shoulder, half expecting to catch someone trailing me, but the path behind was empty, holding on to its secrets like a miser clutching gold. I pocketed the totem this time, its wooden surface cool to the touch. It weighed more than its size suggested, like it carried a gravity all its own. It was just wood and carving, I told myself. The work of an artist messing with hikers, or maybe a series of similar markers from a local tribe. And yet, as I stowed it away, I couldn't shake the sense that I'd just accepted a challenge, or maybe a dare. With the totem in my backpack, the trail seemed to shift in subtle ways. The bird song turned discordant. The roots and rocks seemed to rearrange themselves underfoot. 
I'd been on this trail half a dozen times, but the familiarity had worn thin, leaving me to navigate an uncanny version of a place I thought I knew. My watch beeped, the end of another mile, but when I looked down, the totem was there again. Right on the trail, its carved eyes aimed straight at me. The impossibility of the situation stabbed at my rational mind. I unzipped my bag. The earlier totem was still there, so now there were two, identical down to the minutest detail. A thought invaded my mind like a whispered suggestion. Leave the trail, step into the woods, go where the path leads you. I fought against it, but the thought persisted, echoing louder with each step, as if the forest itself was urging me to stray. I stopped, taking deep breaths to center myself. I was the intruder here, a transient trespasser in a world that danced to ancient rhythms. My eyes scanned the darkened woods around me, half expecting them to part and reveal. What? An answer? A revelation? Finally, I placed both totems side by side on a bed of pine needles, aligning them to face the depths of the forest, and backed away. An air of finality settled, like an unspoken agreement reached. The moment stretched, then snapped. I felt the forest exhale, its breath rustling through the leaves like a sigh of relief. I retreated, leaving the totems to their inscrutable vigil. The trail returned to its familiar state as I made my way back, each mile erasing the sense of dislocation, each step reaffirming the natural order. But the totems remained, at least in my thoughts. Were they guardians or omens? A test or a message? The forest keeps its secrets well, divulging them only to those willing to stray from the path. Yet, even now, the carved faces haunt my dreams, silent, expectant, and always, always watching. The morning sun had barely begun to dip its toes into the sky when I shouldered my backpack and set off. The trail ahead was a familiar one, winding through evergreen forests and alpine meadows. I was miles away from the nearest road, immersed in nature's solitude. That's why the footprints caught me so off guard. I first noticed them around midday, while taking a water break. A set of fresh footprints, imprinted in the moist earth, trailing behind me. My heart seized for a moment. This was a remote area. Encountering another hiker was unlikely, and there was something too deliberate about the footprints, each step precisely placed behind my own, as if tracing my exact path. I looked around, expecting to see another hiker, or at least to hear the crunch of footsteps through the underbrush. But the woods were still, as if holding their collective breath. You're imagining things, I muttered to myself, shaking off the unsettling thought. Maybe an animal had trailed me for a brief moment, its paws oddly mimicking human footprints. I tightened my bootlaces and continued, making a conscious effort to focus on the beauty around me. The spatter of sunlight on ferns, the distant burble of a hidden stream. But as the sun slid lower in the sky, the footprints persisted, Whenever I veered off the main trail, they followed. When I zigzagged through a maze of boulders, they mirrored my steps. Even when I backtracked, trying to catch this unseen follower in the act, I found only their footprints merging with mine, leading back to where I'd come from. An unsettling realization settled over me. Whoever, or whatever, was following me knew the woods better than I did slipping through the forest, unseen and unheard. Rationality warred with instinct. One told me to calm down, that there must be a natural explanation. The other told me to pick up the pace. As dusk started to paint the sky in strokes of oranges and purples, I made the decision to set up camp earlier than planned. I chose an open area where I could easily spot anyone approaching. My hands trembled as I pitched my tent and built a fire 
its flickering light casting both comfort and eerie shadows. Throughout the evening, I was alert to every snap of twigs and rustle of leaves, straining my ears for the sounds of footsteps. But nothing broke the stillness, and fatigue eventually caught up with me. I retreated into the safety of my tent, leaving the dying fire to fend off the darkness. When dawn broke, I unzipped my tent and took a deep breath before stepping out. And there they were, fresh footprints encircling my tent as if my unseen follower had paced a silent vigil all night. This time, a shiver of dread unfurled down my spine, stark and undeniable. I packed up in record time and resumed my hike, cutting my trip short. The footprints followed me all the way back to the trailhead, a silent stalker woven into the fabric of the wilderness. As I reached my car, relief washed over me like a cold shower. I was out. I was safe. I was... My eyes caught something on the ground next to my car. Fresh footprints, leading away into the woods, disappearing among the trees as if daring me to follow. I never did find out who, or what, had been behind me on that trail. I reported it to the park rangers, who shrugged it off as a likely prank or misinterpretation. But I know what I saw, and I know the dread I felt. Sometimes I think about going back, about following those footprints into the depths of the forest to unravel the mystery once and for all. But some questions are better left unanswered, and some trails are better left untraveled. Instead, I carry the experience with me, a chilling reminder that we are never truly alone, even in the most isolated corners of the world. It happened so quickly. One moment she was beside me, laughing as we chased a butterfly. The next, she was gone. I called out her name, my voice swallowed by the thickness of the forest. Hours turned into days, days into weeks. The search parties dwindled, hope waned, and the forest became a forbidden zone, a place of loss and unspeakable grief. Life moved on, but the wound remained fresh. My family was a broken puzzle with a missing piece. Then, 10 years later, Emily returned. I was in the kitchen when I heard the door creak open. My heart sank, expecting to see another hollow-eyed stranger asking about the girl who disappeared. Instead, there she was, standing on the threshold, unchanged, as if a decade had been but a moment. Emily? She nodded. I'm back, Alex. Her voice was the same, a time capsule preserved from our childhood. My parents, stunned into silence at first, broke down in tears and laughter, embracing her as if she were a mirage that might vanish at any moment. Questions erupted like fireworks. Where was she? How did she survive? And most hauntingly, why hadn't she aged a day? I was in the forest, she said softly, but not our forest. It was different, timeless. I tried to find my way back, but couldn't. And then, suddenly, I was here. She spoke of a realm where trees whispered secrets and streams flowed with an ethereal glow. A world almost magical, but also capricious, indifferent to human notions of time and age. Yet she couldn't explain how she had returned only that the forest had let her go. Authorities were baffled. Doctors examined her, finding not a single mark of a decade-long ordeal. Friends and relatives, once jubilant, grew quiet, unnerved by her unchanging presence. But to me, she was still Emily, the sister I had lost and miraculously regained. We returned to the forest, hand in hand, stepping over roots and rocks as we had as children. She led me to the spot where she had vanished, an unremarkable clearing marked only by a lone, gnarled tree. Here, she said, this is where it happened. I looked around, half expecting the air to shimmer, 
or the ground to give way, revealing the magical realm she had described. But the forest remained just a forest, beautiful but silent. Are you okay? I asked, my voice tinged with concern and a hint of sorrow. How do you rebuild a decade of lost time? She smiled, that same radiant smile that had vanished and then reappeared, unchanged. I am Alex. It's not about the time we lost, but the moments we still have. And so we walked back, each footfall a step toward an uncertain but hopeful future. Emily was back, a walking mystery, a timeless child in a world bound by clocks and calendars. Yet, as we left the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that another realm lay just beyond the veil of leaves and shadows, waiting for the next unwary traveler to stray too far from the beaten path. But for now, the forest was once again our playground, a little less mysterious perhaps, but no less wondrous. I'm not someone who believes in monsters or the supernatural, but after what I saw at my uncle's remote cabin, I don't know what to believe. It started as a normal visit to his cabin in the middle of the woods. I was bored one sunny afternoon and decided to explore the surrounding forest. I wandered pretty far from the cabin into the dense trees. Eventually, I stumbled onto a small shed tucked way back in the tree line scrawled on the wooden door in what looked like dried blood were strange symbols and writings I didn't recognize. A big padlock was hanging on the door, but it was unlocked. Against my better judgment, curiosity got the best of me. I slowly opened the creaky door and went inside. It was pitch black and smelled like mold, much bigger inside than it looked from the outside. I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. That's when I saw it. Crouched in the corner was this pale, naked creature with sunken black eyes and rows of jagged, sharp teeth. It was hairless and unnaturally skinny, with long, spindly limbs. It looked right at me, eyes shining with some sort of awareness that didn't seem natural or human. I was frozen in terror and disgust. It made this weird, scuttling movement dragging itself sideways along the wall like a crab, never taking its eyes off me. That snapped me out of it. I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I slammed the door shut and started running blindly into the woods. Behind me I could hear it shrieking, this ear-piercing, inhuman scream. It started clawing at the walls and throwing itself against the door, trying to get to me. The sounds followed me as I ran. I didn't stop sprinting until I got back to the cabin. I locked all the doors and windows, shaking uncontrollably. What I had seen was real, and clearly dangerous. It was evil, some twisted, unnatural thing that should not exist. First thing the next morning, I packed up and left, knowing I would never return. I never told my uncle what I saw. I have nightmares about its empty black eyes staring hungrily at me. It knew I had discovered it. Whatever it was, it did not want to be found. I wish I'd never opened that shed or seen the creature inside. It's an image I'll never get out of my head. Some things are better left alone, hidden away from humanity. There are horrors people aren't meant to know or understand. That pale, skinny thing in the shed was one of them. No good can come from such unnatural things lurking in the shadows. I learned that the hard way. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. 
but it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's Belt, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting, not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed, their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night. Each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breath shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain's summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world, that is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here, or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. 
Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser. The forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time, the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time, a prank, or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all, a mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, 
but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack, a second bark, echoing Stella's but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled, a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark but the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night, and our hikes returned to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, 
attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me, a voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation, impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone in an ancient well chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air. I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are, unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments, 
forever raising questions that dare not be answered. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly, but there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables, nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was. But after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. I'll never forget the summer night my friends and I decided to explore the waterfall and creek on my family's rural property. We were bored teens looking for adventure. Little did we know what we would awaken. As dusk faded to darkness, we hiked along the creek, conjuring imaginary monsters in the shadows. Reaching the waterfall, we scrambled up the slippery rocks, laughter echoing. Behind the cascading water, a recess opened in the cliffside. Flashlight beams revealed a tunnel leading back into darkness. Grinning, we ducked inside, the roar of the falls fading behind us. The narrow cave passage spiraled deep into the earth, dripping water eroding strange patterns on the walls. It felt primal, pristine. Our voices bounced eerily down the unknown corridor. Finally, the tunnel opened into a high-ceilinged cavern with gigantic stalactites hanging like stone daggers. We craned our necks, awestruck. It was like entering a natural cathedral. Venturing farther, we stumbled upon something incredible. An underground lake, ink black and still as glass. Stalagmites ringed the shore like stone sentries. The place seemed off somehow, heavy with secrets best left undisturbed. Shivering despite the cavern's warmth, I turned to leave. The others begged to stay and explore, 
their voices too loud in the oppressive silence. Then, the still black lake began to ripple. At first, just faintly, then increasing until the entire surface roiled and churned violently, frothing white. My friend's laughter turned to screams. I shouted for everyone to run. We tore back through the twisting passageway as roaring filled the cavern, terrible and deafening. I chanced a backward glance and saw a pale, sinuous shape rising from the frothing water, malformed and gargantuan. We scrambled desperately up the slick tunnel, lungs burning, that monstrous roar pursuing us. Finally, we tumbled out behind the waterfall and sprinted down the wooded trail. At the farmhouse, we collapsed, gasping but too terrified to speak of what had awakened in that buried abyss. I only know we unleashed something primeval, lurking in those sunless depths since the dawn of time. Something that knows the surface world still waits above, full of light and life, not yet corrupted. The cave entrance now lies collapsed, sealed shut by a recent quake, according to geologists, but deep in my bones, I know the truth, that the tunnel collapse was no quake. It was the only way to re-entomb that which we should never have freed. I still have nightmares of the warped white form erupting from the subterranean lake, slamming into the cave walls in chaotic rage as it surged toward the surface, toward freedom. Whatever that ancient thing was, it thirsts to be unleashed, and I fear one day it may finish crawling out of the depths we disturbed, its patience eternal. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch, its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly, no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed, its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump. Just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. 
A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly and without a sound? A loud crash came from upstairs as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled. Whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. I'll never forget that brisk fall day I went hiking in the state forest near my hometown. I was enjoying the solitude and the vibrant fall colors when something peculiar caught my eye. A small farmhouse nestled in a clearing deep in the woods. Intrigued, I wandered up to take a look. It was clearly abandoned, the roof sagging and the porch covered in leaves. All the windows were dark and broken. Surprisingly, the front door creaked open at my touch. Inside, everything was blanketed in decades of dust. The simple, rustic furnishings looked straight out of another century. Who had lived in this remote place, miles from any roads? In the bedroom, the remains of a quilt lay on a metal-framed bed. An ancient wedding photo hung askew on the wall. The young, smiling couple stared back across time frozen in that moment, even as their home crumbled around them. I was startled by a sudden thump from above, mice in the attic, I assumed, but as I explored further, more thumps and even scratching sounds came intermittently from the walls and floors. The entire house seemed to vibrate subtly at times. Unease crept up my spine. I entered what appeared to be a child's room, decorated with faded paper cutouts. Thump, scratch. The rhythmic sounds continued, becoming louder, more insistent. This was no mouse. I staggered back as a section of plaster fell from the ceiling, startled by the suddenness. I laughed at myself for being so easily spooked, but as I turned to leave, a floorboard creaked nearby in the hall, as if under slow, heavy footsteps. This was no settling house. My laughter died in my throat. Something was here with me. I rushed outside, heart racing. The empty clearing was still, autumn breeze whispering through the changing leaves. The odd sounds did not follow me out, but they had been real. Some invisible thing dwelled here. I hastily retreated down the trail, glancing back frequently until the abandoned farmhouse disappeared from view. I told no one of the encounter, afraid they would think me mad. But I knew the truth. Something lingered within those crumbling walls, restless and waiting. A 
I've always enjoyed exploring the remote wooded hills around my hometown. There's something magical about being alone among the birds and trees. One Saturday, I decided to hike farther than usual, bringing along a map and a compass. After a few hours, I came to a rocky bluff. In the valley below sat a small, decrepit house, hidden in a hollow between the hills. Curious, I scrambled down for a closer look. The place seemed long abandoned. I circled the sagging porch, peering in the dusty windows. Inside was a simple one-room home, modestly furnished. Books and faded newspapers were scattered across the floor, as if the owner had left in a hurry. A noise behind made me spin around. At the edge of the tree stood a woman, silently watching me. Her old-fashioned dress was filthy and torn, her gray hair in a tangled mess. Surprised, I asked if she lived here. She only stared, expressionless. Uneasy, I turned to leave. Glancing back, I saw her stepping silently into the brush. I hurried up the bluff, confused by the strange encounter. At home, I searched local historical records, finding no indication anyone had lived in that remote hollow for decades. The mysterious woman had seemed like a ghost haunting the abandoned house. Intrigued, I decided to return. The next Saturday, I hiked back to the hollow, entering the house to explore further. Nothing had changed from my first visit. Curiously, there was no electricity or plumbing. It was like stepping back in time. I searched for some clue as to who had lived here, finding only a tarnished silver pocket watch engraved with the initials JB. Just then, movement outside caught my eye. The same elderly woman stood in the yard, staring vacantly. I approached her slowly, asking again who she was. Up close, her eyes were clouded, as if blinded or catatonic. She mumbled incoherently, clutching her tattered dress. I noticed her bare feet were caked in mud and leaves. Growing uneasy, I left her there, swaying, and walked back home. I had to learn who she was and why she inhabited this forgotten place. Over the following week, I scoured archives finally discovering J.B., Jacob Benton, a hermit who had lived in that hollow from 1920 until his death in the 1960s. Could this be his ghost somehow still lingering? Against my better judgment, I returned once more, descending the bluff to confront the mystery. But when I entered the empty house, something felt wrong. There was an earthy, animal smell, trails of dirt scattered across the floor. In Jacob's bedroom, the closet door now hung open. Inside, makeshift bedding lay on the floor, leaves and twigs scattered about. My pulse quickened. Someone had been sleeping here. Back outside, the yard was empty, the woman nowhere to be seen. Uneasy, I left to hike home. Had she been real at all? I now feared returning to that house, yet felt compelled to unravel its secrets. But my curiosity will remain unfulfilled. The next weekend, I searched the hollow in vain. The house and the woman had vanished without a trace, leaving only unanswered questions. I'll never forget that sunny afternoon I went hiking in the slot canyons near my hometown. As an amateur geologist, I loved exploring the mazes of red rock formations that wind through the desert landscape. On that day, I stumbled upon a small cave I had never noticed before, halfway up a secluded sandstone cliff. Against my better judgment, I decided to investigate. I switched on my headlamp and crept into the narrow opening. The cave was larger than it appeared from the outside, consisting of a network of small chambers. 
I ducked through the low tunnels, tracing my hand along the smooth walls that looked almost melt-formed. In the farthest chamber, an arched doorway led into pitch blackness. I paused, then stepped through into the void, my headlamp piercing the darkness. The room was perfectly round, the walls ringing with echoes. It was clearly not a natural formation. I played my light upward, illuminating a domed ceiling. That's when I saw them. Hundreds of humanoid figures carved intricately into the sandstone, covering every inch of the ceiling. I stumbled back in shock. Each figure was different, some with large almond-shaped eyes. None looked quite human. I stood frozen, staring upward, my mind unable to process what I was seeing. These bizarre etchings would change human history if revealed. A scraping sound in the tunnel behind me made me whirl around. For a split second in the flashlight glow, I saw a small hairy creature crouched on all fours. Its eyes reflected the light back like an animal's. Then it scurried away down the tunnel before I could get a better look. I raced after it through the chambers, clambering back up to the cave entrance. By the time I emerged onto the cliff, it had vanished. The surrounding canyons were empty and still. I couldn't shake the image of those eyes watching me from the shadows. I had discovered something incredible and something sinister. I couldn't tell you how I knew, but in my gut, I felt it. This cave was not meant to be found. I returned home, knowing I had to keep its existence secret, at least for now. I could barely sleep that night, troubled by the encounter. What had I seen? And what were the carvings of? The next morning, I hiked back, determined to get photos of the chamber that would turn science on its head. But I couldn't find the cave entrance, no matter how hard I searched the canyon walls. It had simply vanished. Over the years, I returned to the area many times, obsessively seeking the hidden cave. But the sandstone face remained a sheer, unbroken surface. It was as if the cave had never existed at all, the bizarre etchings nothing more than a fantasy. Deep down, I know the truth of what I discovered that day, and more chillingly, that something ancient and unearthly dwells within those lost caverns, protecting its secrets. I've never spoken publicly of the encounter until now, but the time has come to share my story, if only to warn others that some places are not meant to be found. They must remain undiscovered for the good of humanity. As an experienced backpacker and nature photographer, I've hiked hundreds of miles through remote wilderness over the years, but nothing could prepare me for the terror I experienced last week while camping alone in the Boundary Waters. I had hiked deep into the network of lakes and streams, excited to spend a few days completely immersed in nature and solitude. The first night went perfectly. I cooked dinner fireside as the sun set, and then curled up in my tent listening to loons call across the lake. The next morning, I set off hiking again with my camera, hoping to photograph some wildlife. I stopped frequently to snap photos of birds, deer, and other creatures. Late in the afternoon, I came across huge, mysterious tracks in the mud along the trail. They looked somewhat human, but enormous, with only four toes. Unease trickled down my spine, but I shook it off and continued. I set up camp that evening on a scenic ridge. While boiling water for my freeze-dried dinner, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. The birds even stopped singing. Every nerve tingled with the sense something was watching me. Glancing up, I saw a face peering from the brush. Chalk white skin, sunken eyes, and a lipless mouth gazing right at me. 
I shouted in alarm, jumping back. The face vanished. I grabbed a stick from the fire and thrust it toward the bushes, hands shaking, but nothing was there. I spent that night huddled by the dying fire, unable to sleep. At dawn, I discovered enormous man-like footprints circling my tent and dragging from the bushes a long trail where something heavy had been pulled into the forest. Fighting panic, I decided to hike out as fast as possible. All day, I had the creepy feeling of being followed. Twice, I heard odd whooping cries from a ridge parallel to me. They didn't sound like any normal animal. At one point, across a stream, a dead deer lay mutilated, as if flung savagely against a tree trunk. Nerves on edge, I pushed onward. I hiked hours past my usual stopping time, desperate to put distance between me and that thing. Exhausted, I finally made camp after nightfall in a meadow. I boiled water for dinner, but was too wired to eat. The woods were silent as a crypt. Later, drifting off to sleep, I dreamed of hearing footsteps outside the tent. Suddenly, the tent unzipped, and I awoke with a start to see a pale, grinning face staring down from the opening, empty black eyes meeting mine. I screamed and kicked out wildly. The face vanished. Heart racing, I peered outside with my flashlight. Huge, bare footprints surrounded the tent, but the night was still in quiet once more. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran the last few miles back to my truck, constantly glancing over my shoulder. Only when I was driving away did I finally relax, profoundly thankful to have escaped with my life. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning, but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. 
I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and fled in all directions into the trees. I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beast's bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth, and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed or to go anywhere near those woods again. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep, so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing, and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains, and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop, as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. 
I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws, or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't gonna just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back, but uh, w when you're done, just tell me because we're gonna make a run for the cabin, okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure. I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though, as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually, our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in, wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it but I think about it every summer. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes, walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area, 
I have slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I have trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I have hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7am when I found the campsite. 
The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness, until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree, and the desperate-looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, oi. And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white. But I looked at Nate and he just stood there, 
and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did, I did, and so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. 
We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him, and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost, and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay, but I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats, not good for children to be out in. So he took us home and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. 
We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. It was around 10 p.m., and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide-and-seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest, where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress, just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hid around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail. And right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost-seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one, and he said yes. I looked into the woods, and I saw it. It was a small, wispy figure that had a white-gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. 
It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure. Not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing. And he said, oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing. And all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors. And my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside facing wall, facing the very large fenced in backyard, and behind it a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox, either or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. So I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, 
I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying, as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd, because it was in the morning, and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting, and after a while we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, So, you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out, and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out, as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque, and then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey, and it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. I was big into off-trail hiking, 
I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important, because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail, and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains. But there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast, with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely, 
also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range, where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, Disregard. Creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. 
What was creepy about the guard house at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field, and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons, there was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. I 
I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats Mother Nature's creatures. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. 
Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours. And around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips it was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. 
So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington, jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body and somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I was on patrol one night in my town and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. 
Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police, and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood, though. Nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds, even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea. And we haven't heard anything from the Lake Town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away. And that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate so the night sky is generally incredible, with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills and we noticed this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed.
Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange, since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road, and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. 
No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost... I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, She's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. 
Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. I'm telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now, these are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. 
I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, 
still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud 
crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, 
So all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. I work as a park warden in the Canadian wilderness, typically spending my shifts in solitude from 5.30 at night to 2.30 in the morning. My jurisdiction covers around 300 campsites, several beaches, and the corresponding amenities, such as shower facilities. My park closes for the harsh Canadian winter, typically from mid-October to early April, during which feet of snow accumulate and the cold is unforgiving. Several years ago, a tragic incident occurred. A man chose to take his own life with a sawed-off shotgun by the river on one of the more secluded beaches. 
His body wasn't discovered until the spring thaw. This particular beach, situated at the northernmost part of the park, requires a patrol at least once an evening. One overcast day, around 7 p.m., I was at the shower facilities near this beach, ensuring the first aid kits were stocked and checking the fire extinguishers. The dreary weather had deterred any visitors, leaving the beach and parking lot deserted, except for my patrol vehicle. Suddenly, I was overcome by a sense of dread. I ran to my vehicle, slamming the door shut and taking a few calming breaths to shake off the panic. Feeling somewhat better, if not confused, I stayed in the safety of my locked vehicle, completing paperwork and logs. Given my job, not a lot scares me, so I was more shaken by the fact that I responded that way, still not knowing what caused it. Out of nowhere, a large, dark figure moved swiftly past my driver's side window. Startled, I let out a scream, instinctively recoiling as I thought somebody was attempting to break the glass or open the door. However, when I checked, there was no one around. Needless to say, I delegated all future maintenance tasks in that area to the day shift and hurried out of there. It might not be the scariest story ever told, but it deeply unsettled me. Even after three years, I steadfastly refused to conduct foot patrols in that area after sundown. The Forest Had Eyes by Woodchuck Tom. This happened last summer. My friends and I are big time into camping. We would pick the most remote and out of the way spots because, you know, the closer you are to nature, the more real it feels, right? So we were at this spot deep within the Pine Ridge Forest. I changed the name to protect the location. Only the true nature junkies even knew about this place. No cell signal, just you, the trees, and the stars. Perfect. The first night was amazing. Typical camping things, campfire stories, roasting marshmallows, playing the guitar. And then during the second night, things took a turn. I remember waking up to the soft whisper of the trees. Nature's call, maybe around two or three in the morning. I unzipped my tent slowly not wanting to wake up my buddies. As I tiptoed away from the tents, I felt this odd sensation, like I was being watched. You know the feeling you get when you think somebody's staring at you? That. Figuring it was just the paranoia from Pete's ghost stories earlier, I brushed it off. But as I was doing my business, I happened to look up, and right across from me, at the edge of our camp's clearing, I saw it. Two glowing eyes, not too high off the ground, staring directly at me. They weren't like your typical animal eyes reflecting the light. These had an eerie, almost blue glow. My heart froze, but it got weirder. As I scanned the clearing, more pairs of eyes began to appear. All around the campsite, from behind trees, rocks, even peeking from the bushes, all different heights, some close to the ground, others at what I assumed was an adult's eye level. And they all had that same glow. Needless to say, I scrambled back into my tent, zipped it up and lay there, too afraid to make a sound. Every rustle, every chirp, every noise made me jump. I wanted to wake my friends, but I was paralyzed. All I could do was clutch my pocket knife and wait. Morning came, and the eyes were gone. I immediately woke my friends and told them everything. Pete and Lily were skeptical, thinking maybe I had just seen some nocturnal animals or had been half asleep. But Jake? Well, Jake had woken up too that night. He had seen the eyes himself from the small opening of his tent. We packed up at first light and left. As we trekked out, Jake confided that he had heard whispers about the area being sacred to indigenous tribes that once lived there. 
Local legends spoke of spirits and guardians of the forest that watched over sacred grounds. I don't know if what we saw was real or some kind of mass hallucination. Maybe it was one of those guardian spirits, or maybe it was just curious animals. But I know one thing, regardless of what it was, I'm not taking any chances, and I'll never go back to Pine Ridge Forest again. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground, so we were trying to relax, wind down, and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like Truth or Dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc., when at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking, until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first, until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about 3 o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, Whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly 5 to 10 miles in the span of 5 to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started, that was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal. At least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off-tempo, but it sounded accidental, and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. 
We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. Can anyone explain this? By user Nicole Ferguson 6544 posted to r slash backwoods creepy in a comment. To provide some context, my dad owns a parcel of land in eastern Kentucky. I often hike and spend time alone in these woods. Currently, the trails are overgrown with fallen trees, making it impossible for us to use our ATV to ascend the mountain. Consequently, nobody else can either. Bordering our land is 4,000 acres of logging property and an old abandoned trail tunnel that few people approach. Occasionally, our neighbors traverse our trails, but they only come with their dogs or on their ATVs, usually at night for raccoon hunting. They tend to avoid our property when we're around, primarily because they're aware that we disapprove of their presence. Today, I chose to do some homework by the creek that flows through the main hollow, a routine activity for me. Feeling adventurous, I ventured deeper into the woods than usual. Familiar with the landscape, I knew of an overgrown trail about 100 feet up the mountain, nearly inaccessible on foot, without significant effort. I had been in the woods for roughly 90 minutes, and it was around 5 p.m. Given that it was summertime, the hollow was still bathed in daylight, and I felt at ease. However, the woods fell silent and I distinctly heard a man's voice call out, Hey, reminiscent of how my dad would beckon me. I was certain it had emanated from the trail above. Oddly, there was no accompanying sounds of footsteps, snapping twigs or rustling leaves. Reacting instantly, I left my hammock, headed for my car, and drove home, not hearing any other sounds. Relaying the incident to my dad, he initially speculated that it might have been a neighbor. However, this seemed implausible. I had never met any of them, and why would they try to hail me, especially when they knew they shouldn't be on our land in the first place? My dad then confided that he had once encountered an unidentifiable noise in that same hollow. While clearing trails one morning, he heard a chilling shriek. Having grown up in these woods, he's familiar with the calls of foxes, bobcats, and other wildlife. This sound was different. Furthermore, he revealed that locals ominously referred to that hollow as the Devil's Den, though we're yet to ascertain the reason. Backpacks in the Woods by Reddit user Randolio. This story unfolds in August of 2013, amidst the mountains of Southwest Oregon. I served as a U.S. Air Force Security Forces Airman, essentially a military police officer. On one particularly sweltering day that hinted at incoming thunderstorms, 
my girlfriend was working. To escape the town's heat, my buddy Nick, also a military policeman, and I decided to explore some of the back roads. Southern Oregon is a web of logging roads. Some are active, while others are forgotten, shrouded by nature. Many of our off days consisted of venturing on familiar roads, discovering new ones, and navigating for hours into the mountains, eventually leading back to paved routes. On this day, with the storm clouds looming over the mountains, we embarked on an unfamiliar road. An hour into our drive, the signs of civilization seemed non-existent. The thick fir woods made way for a meadow encircled by dense aspen groves. A blanket of unsettling silence draped over the meadow. The usual sounds of birds, insects, or squirrels were conspicuously absent. The oddity in this scene was an unusually large, bright orange picnic table situated near the edge of the tree line. Drawn to its peculiar size and color, Nick steered the vehicle toward it. As we neared the table, a sense of unease took hold. The enveloping quiet of the grove and the impenetrable density of the aspens made the scene even eerier. On closer inspection, the table's dimensions were baffling. Standing at five foot five, I found that the seats were almost chest high, making it almost impractical. Nick, peering into the aspens, drew my attention to a splash of color within the trees, a lone tent approximately 50 feet from the table. The isolation of the tent stirred a deep-rooted fear in me. Surely, anyone camping in such remoteness must have a reason to be so secluded, yet the tent showed no signs of life. Against my instincts, I called out, but the silence persisted. We contemplated leaving, but thoughts of potential dangers or wrongdoings made us reconsider. Nick positioned the truck for a quick escape, while I mustered the courage to approach the tent. The sight was unsettling, scattered backpacks, no sign of a campfire, and the tent, it was filled with more backpacks and women's clothing. Before I could process the situation, Nick's frantic shouts pierced the air. Let's go, let's get out now, come on. Rushing back, my eyes locked onto an old Ford Taurus, its presence barring our exit. Two men occupied the car, while a third unidentifiable individual pressed against the back window. Nick wasted no time. He revved the engine, swerving around the blocked car and speeding down the road we'd come from. A glance back showed the Taurus struggling to make a U-turn. Thankfully, we reached the highway without another glimpse of it. I reported the incident to the state police. They committed to investigating, but a follow-up call revealed the campsite, backpacks, and clothing had vanished, leaving only the table as proof of the odd encounter. I've steered clear of that area ever since, and I have no intention of returning. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens, until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves, and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. 
The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods. So we packed up, got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds, screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it.
Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins, then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend, but leaving him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped ragged overalls that had no more color and a worn out colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin I decided to lock the door to my room just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, 
who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams and I'm in no rush to see it again. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150 acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, 
they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. 
unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high-pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA, 
That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite, and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance, and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen. 
if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried, though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110%, because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, Yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy. And very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more and then went to the next one and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent. And its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent. And it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear. And once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us, and finally it faded away ahead of us, as if it had gone ahead but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse and there would have been had it been raining and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed, 
in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5pm for a very long time.